Hey Data Junkies, welcome back. This is the final video for your lecture series of the course. This is Closing Up Multiple Regression. It's been a fantastic journey to have you with me and I just want to carry you through on this next one to see you through the end. This last one is going to wrap up the topic course with a topic on polynomial terms. These are a special case of transformations and how we can use them in the regression model to understand curvilinear effects. So let's go ahead and talk about polynomial terms. But again, just caveat I want to mention, there is another topic area on causal diagrams, but this one's going to be just available to you in the slides for you to peruse at your leisure, and definitely come see me if you have any questions about how we can talk about causal diagramming. Let's go ahead and work then into polynomial terms here. So we were saying before that we're modeling these linear processes, that we assume that there is some linear relationship between your predictor variable and your outcome variable, and that generally speaking, we would want them to be correlated, which means as x goes up, so does y, as x goes down, so does y, or as x goes up, y goes down, and vice versa. Generally speaking, there is this linear relationship. But sometimes we find things in life that are curvilinear. They go up at some point, they bend and come back down, or they go down and then they bend and come back up. Sometimes there's multiple bends. They go up, then down, then up, then down. And trying to fit these to a straight line is like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. It just doesn't really work. And if you try to force it, it fits, but not as well as it could. Let's take, for example, the one that we have on the screen here. It's a classic example I like to use that between age and athletics. As one gets older and they're really young, they tend to be sort of gangly and they're falling all over themselves, you know, and they just don't have much athletic coordination. Then they come into their young adulthood and, the, and they tend to uh, gain more physical confidence, insurance, and capability, and their athletic performance increases. And eventually at some point, usually in their 20s to early 30s, you tend to hit what's considered like a peak athletic performance. You're at your very best, and then you start at a tipping point. And all of those years of being athletic starts to weigh on you a little bit. You're not moving as fast as you could and as strong as you were. And next thing you know, you're a little bit older and you're getting towards mid-age. And your knees and back start aching. And you're just, you're not as athletic as you could still be athletic, but you're not as athletic as you were when you were young. And so it has this sort of curvilinear effect. And fitting our regression line to it just doesn't work very well. So polynomial terms are a solution to this. Now, what happens is by exponentiating our predictor variables, we start squaring and cubing and quadraticizing our different variables here. And every time you add a different polynomial with it raised to another power, we can add another bend. So a linear line has no polynomials. It's just x to the first powers, if you will. And that fits a straight line. When we add a quadratic, adding an x squared, we can then model a single bend. When we add a cubic to a third power, we can model a bend in one direction and then a bend to the opposite direction. And for every polynomial term, it adds an additional bend into the opposite direction from there. So how do we go ahead and use these and why do we use them? Well, first of all, it helps us solve assumption violations. And it helps us get better metrics like R squareds and RSEs and things like that. When we were saying before and we had the uh, bad fit with the age and athletic performance, that's going to give us a terrible R squared and a terrible RSE. And it's going to probably cause us all sorts of problems with our linear regression assumptions and uh, homoscedasticity and things of this nature. So by putting them into squared terms, we could probably be doing so much better. So let's see how this actually works to our particular advantage. So I have on the screen here a smaller version of my age and athletic performance. And the way this is going to work is I'm going to model a curved line instead of a straight line. Now this is still linear in the parameters when we get to the regression coefficients because we're not exponentiating the coefficients. We're exponentiating the x's, which we can do. And so if I was to exponentiate age, squaring age, what that will allow me to do is model as I go up. So at some point there's going to be a positive amount of effect on the slope. It's going to hit a tipping point and after that it's going to turn and go and be negative. But how does this work? How do the mechanics work? Well, if the beta slope that I'm dealing with uh, is positive, then it's going to be a U-shape. If the beta slope is negative, 
then it's going to be an N shape, just in terms of graphical speaking here. And so where does that tipping point start to come in? So in this case here, I have a sort of example regression models here where I have your athletics is being predicted by a y-intercept plus a coefficient of age minus a coefficient of age squared. And it's minus in this case because that's what the exponent would happen to be in the model that we're looking at here because we're saying before that if it's a negative value then it's going to be n-shaped. So if I was to just go ahead and run these, we're going to see the, the numbers and how they work out in a second, but let's just see the effect of how these happen to work here. So the one up on the top, I'm regressing age onto athletic performance, and I have a regression coefficient, a very small one of 0.034 and change, and it's not statistically significant at all. My p-value is like 0.9. And that makes sense, given that I had this sort of N-shaped curve, and I'm trying to stuff a red line onto it. My multiple r squared is sitting at like negative many zeros and a seven. Bad all around. Down below, I have a regression of age plus age squared. And all I did is I took the age value and I squared it, and I added that into the term, into the regression model. So now, my regression coefficient for age is a sizable 5.5, and my p-value is tiny. 5.09e to the negative 12. My age squared coefficient is negative 0.09 and a very small p-value there as well. Now, before I had, I was showing you on the previous slide, the regression model equation was that negative b squared that came here from the regression coefficient of that negative 0.09 indicating that it's going to be a downward u, I'm sorry, n-shaped curve here. And that r squared went from 0 0.00007 to 0 0.9355. Boom! Huge! Fantastic! Model p-value, tiny, right? Down below 0 0.00001. So, looking fantastic. It looks like fitting that age squared just did the trick that we needed to, to get it to do. Let's see how that tipping point works, though. So what I have up here is the regression model up at the top, kind of showing where we're at, the graphic sort of in the middle, and on the left side here, I have a table. And what we're modeling here is the age in the leftmost column. These are just uh, ages of potential people in the observance. And what the coefficient of that 5.5 times age would be, then the squared coefficient, that negative 0.1 times age squared, and then what the predicted value is going to be, that, that y hat. And so what we can see is that as age is equal to 8, the age coefficient is 44, the age squared co value is 6.4, and the predicted value is 14.6. And what we're generally seeing is that age times its coefficient keeps going up and up and up and up like we would expect it to, as does age squared. But age squared is a negative value. So what's going to happen is that our predicted value, tracking that along, the predicted value is going to go up and up and up and up. And eventually, at around point age 28, we're going to hit a zenith, the top of the hill. In this case, it's going to be at approximately a predicted age score of 52.6. Because then once we get into age 30, our predicted athletics turns to 52. At age 32, we're at 50.6. At age 40, it's now 37. Age 48, 10.6. And it's rapidly coming down from there. So what we're then seeing is this effect where when someone is young, the coefficient for age is large enough that it overpowers the effect of the age squared, causing the effect on y hat to increase. But at some amount of peak age, that age times the age squared catches up. It becomes large enough. It nullifies the effect on the original age coefficient and balances out at the zenith. And then every additional age there forward drives that age squared to be larger than the age coefficient, overpowers it, it's a negative value, and brings the regression line back down. And that's the fundamental mechanics of how the polynomial works. So let's go ahead and just 
again checking these model fits I mentioned them before but I just want to highlight these here for you as we go that when you're looking at the model here and we're comparing them across we already said that it's that better fit but now the residual standard errors went from about 20.36 in the just age drops down to 5.315 in the age squared fantastic model fit multiple r squared goes from super tiny up to 9.335 and the p-values jump entirely oh but wait a minute that's a really high r squared like really high that goes past tolerance of 0.10 well, that brings us to the topic of polynomials and multicollinearity. So remember that one way to reduce, I'm sorry, not reduce, introduce multicollinearity is to construct a variable from a model built from other variables you already have. Well, what do you think age squared is? Age squared is age times age. And so that is going to naturally produce, you can't get around it, that effect of having a multicollinearity into your model. Now we can't see what a VIF of a single variable of age would be because you need to have at least two terms and we only had two variables in the model to begin with. So what's going to happen if I do the VIF of age squared? Well it turns out that when I have age and age squared in here that my VIF scores are off the charts. Well not literally off the charts but they're huge. They're more than 20. The mean VIF more than 20. This is massive amounts of multicollinearity. How can I fix it? Boom. Models. The bo it's just so much multicollinearity. In fact, this is what we would call structural multicollinearity. It's that sort of multicollinearity you just can't get around based on the factor of what it is that you're trying to do. In this particular graphic here, I'm modeling age against age squared, and you see this exponential growth effect against its regression line, and it's just no way around it. So, how can we fix that sort of exponentiated structural multicollinearity? We do it with a mean centering. In the previous video, we talked about how to do a mean centering transformation. We're going to take age minus mean age to get the age mean centered. And then we also take age mean centered and we square it to get age mean centered squared. And if you were if we were to plot out mean centered age against mean centered age squared, we no longer have a structural multicollinearity plot. We've got a nice curve, low regression, low p, everything's looking good. If I was to go ahead and run a regression model, with my age of mean centered and my age of mean centered squared. No problems with the VIF scores. No problem with the mean VIF. Everything's looking good. Super small. Problem solved. Run them into the regression again. Get that do over. I now have new coefficients. Super small p-values. My RSC is still tiny. I'm still getting a strong multiple R squared explanation effect but I'm not getting the uh, actual multicollinearity problem that I did before. Life is fantastic. Problem solved. Now, the other question that I have to ask myself is, I fixed the multicollinearity, multicollinearity issue, but did I have to? Officially, yeah. If you have multicollinearity, you're supposed to fix it. Unofficially, no. Polynomial terms are naturally multicollinear, as we saw before by their, their natural fact and go ahead and fix it if it's a major concern. But if your p-values are really small and doing fine and your standard errors are looking good, then it might just be easier to keep it as it is. Instead of having to worry about squaring and interpreting a mean-centered, sometimes interpreting mean-centering isn't necessarily as easy as interpreting it if you just leave it in terms of its original scale. So it might be just a more intuitive sense to leave this as it is without the mean-centered. But if you're concerned about the assumption effect, go ahead and fix it for sure. If you have other variables in your model and you're not sure how the multicollinearity may be spilling over to them as well, mean centering can help there uh, and help with that as well as, as far as it's going. So 
whether you do or you don't, I'm going to leave that decision on your hands there, but no one understand if all you're dealing with is the polynomial, you've got some freedom and flexibility here based on what they are. Note the p-values in our function didn't really change, the RSE really didn't change, and, and we were good to go. And as I close out, I'm going to go ahead and recommend uh, a video, again, by Mike Marin, where he talks about polynomial regression in R. I think it's fantastic stuff. Uh, and otherwise, that's going to go ahead and wrap up our talk on multiple linear regression. Congratulations. You now know linear regression the best, right? I know. So go ahead and pat yourself on the back. You've passed the last final lecture. And everything else here is moving into review mode towards the final exam. We're going to talk about bonus lectures. I'm probably going to be rolling out something with binary dependent variables for you to work on. But after that, congratulations. You're there, buddy.